Hello, welcome to episode 8 of The Bitcoin Game. I'm Rob Mitchell. Dan O'Farron's current day job is working on Java for the Oracle Corporation. But for fun, Dano uses his programming skills to create visualization software for the Bitcoin blockchain. In the wake of the large Bitstamp theft, Dano has been able to analyze some of the Bitcoin movements using his software. Dano might be one of the most knowledgeable people about this loss, other than insiders like Bitstamp employees and the actual hacker. Dano speculates on what happened, and we also discuss a few other topics. I hope you enjoy this episode of The Bitcoin Game with Dano Farron. Hi, Dano. Hello. Thanks so much for agreeing to come on my show. The way I stumbled upon you was uh, I was really curious to find out technical details about Bitstamp's uh, issue where they lost so many Bitcoins. And just scouring everywhere online, Bitcoin articles as well as Twitter or Reddit, you seem to be most hands-on with actually tracking transactions. As far as I could tell, you were as, as expert as anybody outside of Bitstamp about this issue. Tell me a little bit about your background. In this age of Bitcoin, probably the first question if you ask is, when did you first get involved with or learn about Bitcoin? And, you know, I heard about it, and I think it was a slash dot, and one of the editors was laughing, like, no, you can't play me in Bitcoin. This is like three years ago. Um, but when I really got interested, um, I was on Reddit at the time, and this was sometime between when the Silk Road seizures first happened. And there was a, a Fed meeting with Bernanke right before the $1,000 run-up. And that's about when I started following it because there were some interesting things. And I really started you know, getting interested in the non-technical side on it at that point. Um, it wasn't until after the $1,200 run-up on Mt. Gox that I really got interested. And I actually picked up the uh, Satoshi White Paper and I actually read it. And that was eye-opening. Um, just the subtlety of some of the mechanics in there and how effectively it, it works. And I just kind of obsessed over that over the Christmas break. It didn't work anything like I expected it to. And in fact, it was even more interesting than I'd first imagined. Shortly after that, Coinbase was running one of their hackathons. Um, it was actually their only hackathon and they'd thrown the first one that they'd thrown. And I thought, you know what? There's there's like two or three months. Um, I, I like doing these graph data, these graph visualization things. This is a graph. I think I understand enough about the way that the transactions and the um, and the outputs and the inputs and the unspent outputs work. So I gave a go at it and I wrote up this application I wound up releasing on the App Store, which doesn't work anymore because of technical reasons, called Follow the Bitcoin, where you could look at these transaction graphs. And so I, I you know, I wrote this. I probably spent way more time on it than I probably should have just because I was having so much fun. You know, there's some, some interesting technical challenges in there because it was a Coinbase hackathon. I thought, well, maybe I should let them log into Coinbase and throw their transaction numbers in there and they could visualize that and there really wasn't much interesting to see from that. But it, it checked one of the boxes in their hackathon that you had to use the Coinbase API somehow. And it, you know, with, with the toolkit I was using, JobFX, it was presented some interesting challenges of you know getting a web page up for their OAuth authentication. So it there was some some really entertaining um, technical challenges. That's the sort of thing I like to do. So I spent a few months doing that and then I submitted it to the hackathon. And then I just just put it to the side. How much of that programming was uh, stuff you were very familiar with, and how much? Uh, what did you have to learn to to be able to hack that together? I really only had to learn the Bitcoin stuff. Um, I I knew about there was a graphing library that I'm using under the covers JGraph. It's not my favorite graphing library. Uh, the one that I'd really like to use is about ten thousand dollars a year. And since this is a hobby, that's kind of an expensive sum of money for a hobby. Um, it's called Y Files. It's the best one out there. But I also knew JavaFX. I've been doing that for a while. I knew Java. I've been doing Java since the 20th century. I know all about you know a lot of the threading, a lot of the deep, gory details. I really only had to learn basically the details of the Bitcoin transactions and how to load those in. So once I once I learned that those details, I I put it together. I submitted it. Um, I came in for I, I think it was like a 80 way tie for 25th, which means it's the ones that didn't list for finalists or honorable mentions. They just didn't rank them. But you know, there wasn't. I didn't do it expecting to win. It was it was a fun technical challenge, and it was someone else's deadline that I had to meet in some external standards, which actually kind of ironically helped solidify a creative process. So anyway, so I put this aside, and then when I was on vacation with my family during spring break, um, we went to Legoland in California, and you know these theme parks got lots of time in the lines, or your kids on the ride, and there's only so much video you can film with it. So I was, I was on my phone, I was looking through Reddit, and then I saw that, oh my goodness, there's this gigantic 180,000 Bitcoin transaction that's splitting and splitting. This is where I really got excited about you know, some of the possibilities of this tool. Is a lot of people were freaking out over this 180,000 Bitcoin pyramid. 
There was another parallel pyramid that was similarly being split that was 20,000 coins, and they were trivially linked. But the thing is, you had to step out a couple of transactions from each one of them. If you're looking at them in a block explorer, you're just looking at a tree. But when you visualize the graph and you show the connections between everything, you're looking at the forest. And you can see the connections between the individual transactions. I think the power of visualization of some of these things is you can step back from the trees, look at the forests, look at the trails, and look at some of the greater connections. So that was one of the most exciting things. I did that for a few visualizations. This is back in March of last year. I did some more entertaining things. I found out that there were some people still depositing money in their Mt. Gox addresses, and that was getting swept up into the pyramid. And there's there's many places that's happening in the pyramids. I'm supposed to be writing a paper for an upcoming conference where I'm going to outline some of these transaction patterns that I see. And at first, when I was looking at these, it's like, I have no idea what I'm doing. It's like that Reddit thing, where it's the dog at the computers. It's like, I have no idea what I'm doing. But you know, I looked at some of these, and I read some Reddit posts about some of these known transactions I was reading, and did some more research. Um, Sarah Micklejohn out of uh, UC San Diego, I, I, reading some of her paper to help me understand some of the, the way some of the transactions are going on. She identified um, a pattern called appeal chain, where somebody, you know, they have these spend and change outputs where they they spend it on one and the chain goes somewhere else, and these these chains go together, they just peel off different payments. And I started seeing that all over the place in a lot of locations. You definitely have been following specific transactions related to Bitstamp. Can you go over a little bit what what you've seen? This all started last week. Um, you know, I'm off and on with this project. You know, I, every time something interesting comes up on the Reddit thread, I pull it out and see if I can find anything interesting. And so the thing that popped out was that, you know, they were having problems with Bitstamp. And while I was researching it, the news came out, Bitstamp announced um, that they were shutting down transactions due to some anomalies in their hot wallet. So it's like, oh, wow, this is something great. You know, I was probably supposed to be doing work that morning, but I decided to, you know. So one of the great things about working from home is you can shift the hours you work all over the place. So I spent the morning writing a blog post. And uh, this was the Bitstamp hot wallet theft to Jan to 5 Jan. This was actually kind of a, a big break for me. This was really exciting for me. Um, so I went through the analysis and I said, well, okay, well, here's the wallet. You know, this is the, it's going into the wallet. It started happening here. There was two big jumps. You know, here's a picture of all the connections. But then I started addressing some of the concerns I'd seen on Reddit. Someone on Reddit had said, not only have they lost their hot wallet, but their cold wallet is leaking. So I was able to dig up an old address that they had used for one of their audits um, that I consider to be most containing, you know, a substantial portion of their of their cold storage. And I noticed that there was a quick uptick um, right at the end of the graph, you know, up currently. And, you know, there's so much money in there. You know, there's at its height, there was, you know, 225,000 um, bitcoins in this address, um, you know, that had been spent elsewhere and moved to other parts of cold storage. But I noticed at the very end of it, there was a little hiccup of about 6,000 bitcoins. And you zoom in. Um, with the graph, and sure enough, there's a nice big uh, 6,000 Bitcoin. So I put those you know, two transactions together, and then I put the two graphs next to each other, and I said, look, um, at the 20-hour mark about of the hack, um, it looks like they took the 6,000 remaining Bitcoins in their wallet, they swept it in their cold storage to minimize the damage that they were experiencing um, from this hot wallet anomaly, You know, whether it was you know, a system gone wild or whether someone was actually in there stealing the coins and spending it. Um, these have been swept out. Um, to take it off the table. And then the next day, I, I got a, uh, uh, a media request from Coindesk. And, you know, I spent a couple phone calls explaining some of the details because, you know, my blog post is written on a very technical level. And Coindesk wants to write an article that is um, something that, you know, my, my sister could understand or my mom or my brother. My brother's, you know, an IT guy. You know, he does email servers. He doesn't know Bitcoin that much. But I think the big break that I had there in looking at some of this was Bitstamp had taken, they probably had 25,000 Bitcoins in their hot wallet. And it's probably the practice they had. One of the things, if I get free time, I've got a lot of things on my block, is to, to look at the addresses they had in here, try and reconstruct as much of their hot wallet as possible. Because, you know, one of the white combinator threads I read is like, well, why do they need 16,000 Bitcoins in their hot wallet? And, you know, my thought is if I can go back there, they probably do have a rational need for 25,000 Bitcoins in their hot wallet in the event of a run, because there's probably... You know, my hypothesis, if I go back and look at their hot wallet level, there probably have been some 10, 15,000 Bitcoin runs in their hot wallet. And they don't want to tell people, you know, come back tomorrow. Uh, we need to move wallet, uh, coins out of cold storage because that's going to cause a bank run and things are going to spiral out of control. So, you know, I, I do think it is, you know, a rational course of action to keep 10 to 20 percent of your coins in your hot wallet if it's going to prevent a bank run. The, the wallet I found, um, it was uh, one JLCT and it had been used in an a audit apparently done in early December. 
And at the height of it, they had uh, about 224,000 um, Bitcoins in there. So you add in the 25,000 Bitcoins they probably had in their wallet. So at the height of it, in this current era, they probably had about a quarter of a million Bitcoins just in their exchange. And that's just their private holdings. You know, I don't know if that's the only audit wallet that they had. I don't know if they put it in other wallets. I don't know if they spread it out smaller. Um, but it is consistent with the number that they've they've announced in audit in May. They really haven't announced one since May. Since I don't have corroborating evidence on the other side, you know, one of the phrases that I find myself saying a lot is it fits the narrative. And there's no competing explanation for why it wouldn't fit the narrative. So when I saw that number, the first thing that I thought was, well, do these coins really intersect or is this just some coincidental thing? So I did another analysis. I took this JOCT address and I put it on the same graph as the 1L2JS address and I actually saw that um, the uh, JOCT address was being fed from a change um, amount from one of the L2JS, one of the theft transactions. So the, the thief came in, stole Bitcoins in the L2JS, but they did the math wrong. They had some change. So it automatically spit it out into a change address that, that Bitstamp knows how to use. And then that change address went into a Bitstamp transaction where they shuffled it into cold storage. So, you know, that to me confirmed that these two events were connected. And Coindesk, through their connections, we were able to confirm that the JOCT address was used in one of their audits. So I have, you know, very high confidence that, you know, these two addresses, one was the theft and then one was Bitstamp. Um, saving at that point, you know, they probably thought, well, we know what's going on here. We can just try and fix it. And probably at some point, you know, I know nothing. This is just pure speculation. But at some point, somebody pulled the trigger and said, no, we're going to shut down. Let's take all the coins off the table. and Let's just restart and rebuild from a backup. You know, we don't know what they're doing. And it's obviously causing more damage. We have to go into damage control mode. Let's shut down for a week and, and get it right. If they thought they knew where the hacker was going in, if they thought they knew what the hacker was doing, like if it was, you know, one theory, you know, I'm just completely making stuff up, I know nothing. But if, if a hacker had control of one of their servers uh, via an IP address, you know, if they're using an IRC, um, maybe they could block access to that computer from the various ways that it might get into send its information. Um, which, you know, can be tricky, you know, if, if the control channels through IRC, it just shut down the IRC ports or anything that looks like IRC or any connection you don't recognize. But if they're doing trickier things, like if they're sending control messages through one of the other blockchains they might be trading in, you know, in secret messages there with addresses, if you see transactions to this address, fire up, you know, there's all sorts of paranoid ways that you could conceive of that they might be sending messages to. Do you have reason to believe that they did somehow control one of their servers? Um, that's not my favorite theory. Um, I don't think they were in control of a server, but I do think they were on the inside. My theory, based just on what I've been looking from, you know, their behaviors, in their integration of the uh, BitGo Hot Wallet. Again, I have no inside knowledge on this. But if I had to just, just make a guess and, and put up a uh, Vegas bet on it, somebody broke in, found a specific server that was signing these transactions. If they found the part of the subroutine that was saying, okay, so here's the input address. Um, let's put it into this input address, sign it, and put it out. And so my theory is that they changed that code so that it always spits it out to the 1L2J wallet. And so what they were noticing is that these uh, payouts were going only at certain times. You know, if, if they were a known customer, they can do some of these payouts by like trying to get someone to withdraw money. So whenever a, a legitimate payout would happen from the hot wallet, it wouldn't go to where it was supposed to. It would go to the 1L2JS wallet. You know, if the hacker did that, they could just put that code in, walk away, and just wait for the money to start going in. They didn't need any connection into the Bitstamp servers. They've been in and out. There's no way to, to track them, no way to connect to them. The reason why I think that's right now my favorite theory is BitGo had a big press release that Bitstamp is using the BitGo multi-signature wallet. And the way the BitGo multi-signature wallet works is you could think of it as instead of writing out checks that require one signature, they now write out checks that require two signatures. Bitstamp forms the check. They say, okay, let's go here, here. Let's sign it and hand it over to BitGo. And then BitGo, they have a list of rules that they go through. And if everything passes up for the rules, they put the second signature on the transaction and shove it out on the blockchain. So what they could have done in this hack, if they had BitGo in place last week, is they could just call up BitGo early in the hack, you know, when they've lost, you know, 5,000 coins and say, do not sign any transaction that has 1-2-J-S as a destination. And if the situation was where the hacker came in and they wrote that code and that's what was going on, then they would have been fine. They would never have had any second signatures on any of these transactions. That's a nice granular control I hadn't considered with a service like that. Yeah. And when you think about it, it's some basic financial controls. Um, you know, you go into some, some of these bigger audits 
and they look at a signing process, if there is a step where, you know, someone where a single signature on a single check can take out a sum of money greater than, you know, a thousand dollars or some sum of money, that's something that the auditors are going to come up and say, you know, this is a great way to get fleeced by your employees. You know, you need to have better controls. You need to have two signature checks processes in some of the organizations I've been involved in. Every, every check that we sign involves two signatures. So if you're going to steal money, you got to get two of them and getting a conspiracy with two people is a whole lot harder than getting a conspiracy with one person, you know, and things like that fall apart a lot quicker and include includes a, a higher level of control. So, you know, as, as far as integrating, you know, this outside signer, you know, that's, I think that's a great solution for what they're doing. If, if, if indeed my hypothesis about what happened is right. And, you know, I'm just guessing there, I have no idea if that's really what happened. It sounded like maybe you did have some info that I wasn't aware of, though. What was literally that the mechanism when someone withdrew money? That was the only time it went to this other wallet. That's part of my theory, and the reason I say that, if if you look at the output wallet, there's a couple of big jumps, but then there's these small little dribble jumps, um, and that would you know I would expect that they have big customers and small customers getting money in and out all the time, and Bitcoin in and out all the time. You know, they got a quarter million bitcoins in there. It's entirely possible that they have customers that have 100,000 Bitcoin accounts in there, you know, at the very least 10,000 Bitcoin accounts in there. And they, they might want to bring those out. This is the time if you're an institutional investor and you think Bitcoin is going to have long term value to go in and buy. And when they come in, they come in with large sums of money. I mean, that's generally been the problem with with this Bitcoin liquidity is there's just not enough Bitcoins in the market for liquidity. You know, a, a 10,000 Bitcoin purchase could move the price 20 bucks. One little tidbit I haven't told you yet is this morning I got a response from Damien Merlach, Bitstamp's founder and CTO, mm -hmm. saying he was interested in talking to me in response to me asking about an interview. So I, I don't, I'm not counting on it happening, but um, he seemed interested. So maybe I'll actually get to find out <laughs> some details. That'd be interesting. Yeah. If there were any questions, like you're just dying to know, um, do you have any questions you'd love to ask? I don't know. I haven't thought of that. But the, the thing is, I, I don't know how much you're going to get from him. I used to work at a defense contractor. So you go through some of these briefings where you learn about things like operational security and information security. Um, you know, information security is, is protecting the dirty pictures you have of your general. And operational security is never taking those pictures. So I don't know if, you know, they're going to spill the beans on specific details of how the hack happened. Um, you know, they're, they're, I might expect some confirmation that, yes, we know exactly what it is, and yes, we fixed it. And if you're lucky, you might say, and yes, Bitco is part of the solution to do that. But I wouldn't expect them to say, oh, yeah, well, he came in. He came in from a uh, from an email, from an IP address in Hong Kong, and he attacked the server over here that was doing our signing, and we were catching it on the checkout. And then finally, I was late for dinner appointment, and I said, you know what, I don't have time to handle this. Shut it down for a week. You know, I, I doubt you'll get that. You're making me suddenly feel very naive. <laughs> that makes sense. It, it might just be a very a PR moment where they don't really give me anything at all. And well, ask, ask the hard questions anyway. I, I've got a few. So here's a question. Sure. Why did it take you 20 hours from the beginning of the hack to decide to take the money out of the hot wallet? You know, what was driving that? Did you think you had a solution? Were you running out of time? You know, it's... They had already lost two thirds of their hot wallet. You know why? Why was that the threshold? My own gut guess, if I was in that position, would be just trying to figure out is that the best action, and really laboring over that decision. You know, maybe there's some better way to go. Right. I mean, yeah. It's, it, there's 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 absolutely some considerations. Like, well, if we shut it down, there's a bad PR. You know, we probably weigh that as you know we could handle up to fifteen thousand Bitcoin losses before we really need a panic and go into a, to a higher level of of, of, of crisis. And once that once that threshold was crossed, because um, it looks like here they did some tickle trades at the beginning to see if they could actually move it into the cold storage without triggering whatever was happening. So they did a few of these, and then they just started wholesale moving in as many as they could find into the into the cold storage. That might be you know probably more details than he's willing to give. But that would be something I want to know is you know what triggered it, and what process did you go through when you decided it's time to shut things down and, and take the money off the table. So I was following the output of the Bitstamp hack. On Wednesday, they had put it into three addresses. I thought, oh, it would be cute just if all these addresses going on down. But then they just went crazy giving it to all different people, um, putting in a Bitcoin tumblers. One of the most interesting things they did is there's this uh, iOS game, Sabutori, I guess is how it's pronounced. But the gimmick is, is if you complete certain levels, they'll actually tip you Bitcoins. 
and their their bucket had run dry. So that bucket got filled with coins from the bitstamp theft. The whole Bitcoin was put into the Sabatori game, so that you know when you when you succeeded at your levels, you could get your your millibit tip. And it's you know it's a genius way to spread the taint of this theft around to everyone else's wallet. Mm. You know, as far as you know, if you do the backward checks, like oh no, this has heritage back to the Bitstamp theft. Yeah, so does practically everybody who has ever played that that iOS game now and put their wallet address in there. So that's really interesting. Anything else that comes to mind, specifics, what, what they've done? One of the first things they did, I thought was interesting, and I don't know if it was the original thief that did this or not. Um, I came across, um, I think, the world's smallest coin join as far as inputs and outputs. I think there would be a bigger market for this sort of deep analysis software if CoinJoin hadn't come in and made it you know, anything but dead simple. So CoinJoin is where you get five people or some number of people who come in with their sets of transactions and say, hey, let's do a transaction. So they all agree this is what the transaction looks like for one round, and then it goes back around another round. And you look and see, okay, my input matches up with what I'm going to spend, and we're spending the right amount of money to where I want it to go. So I'll sign the transaction. And it goes around, everyone signs it, and then it goes through. And um, when that happens, you can't be sure that the money that's been put in is what came out from you. So I found this one transaction. They put in one Bitcoin. Someone put in 0. 0.8881546 Bitcoins. And goes into the transaction. And what spits out, one side gets a one Bitcoin. And one side gets um, 0. 0.8880 And you look into the details, and lo and behold... There's a 100-bit fee that has been paid on there. And there's this, this whole chain of this two-in, two-out coin join transaction where people put in some amount, and then this washer would put it in, take it out, and pay the fee to get it pushed through. So that, that I think, was one of the most interesting things I found is that little washer. You know, I'm not much up in the dark net. I'm not much up in looking for these Bitcoin tumblers, these Bitcoin fog, and all these, these different things to try and hide your money. But it's really interesting to stumble upon the operation of one of these just in some of the smallest, tiniest ways, it's kind of fascinating to find. Well, yeah, I mean, specifically with the kind of uh, work you're doing looking at these transactions and this trying to obfuscate transactions, it seems like a great meeting. <laughs> you know, one of the things about this transaction is I could do the math in my head to figure out this, this, this in and this out and this in and this out. So another thing, not in this, but, you know, a while ago when I started doing this, I'd come across these transactions that have like, 40 inputs and 30 outputs and you know foolish me i would expand all the outputs and they'd have these these this intricately connected network where some outputs go into this and some inputs go into this and it's really confusing and you know the, when, when you get start getting up to uh, numbers as big as you know 40 in and 30 out you can't just run the common metrics to try all possible combinations and say okay these are the possible steps for it um so you know as far as you know one of the things I learned about doing this in CoinJoin is the more people you can get to join in, the better as far as directly hiding what your transaction is. But on the other hand, you know, I like to think of it as, you know, sharing the same water in a bathtub. You know, someone takes a bath and then you take a bath and then someone else takes a bath. Eventually, you're going to share everyone else's problems in that. You know, that's, that's one of the downsides of CoinJoin is you don't know what problems their money is bringing in and you're going to now going to be connected to their network. That's an interesting thought. You know, that's one of the downsides of CoinJoin. So unless you know all the people participating, you don't know what their issues are. Christoph Atlas, for a while, he was trying to create a coin join Soduco um, solution that would run these these transactions backwards. But he's he's never released the software. And my thought is that he ran into a uh, a computational wall. The the common metrics on this are just so huge that if you structure some of these correctly, um, it's impossible from the single coin join transaction alone to figure out what's going on. Now, going back to Bitstamp a little bit, apparently they're running everything off of Amazon servers now. And I saw Peter Todd commented that basically he didn't like that. He felt that gave, I'm assuming, the NSA just a little bit easier time if they wanted to to try to, I, I, I'm just assuming, connect identities with Bitcoin addresses. I guess they collect all the information anyway to do all their know your customer stuff. Just wanted to throw that at you and see if you have a take on it. Well, so there's a couple of takes on that. There's the layer that is above Bitcoin and computers itself, which is, you know, if they're on an Amazon, they don't need to be on an Amazon um, web server to be subject to some of this NSA stuff. And it's not even a computerized snooping. If they do business with customers in America and the NSA can prove it, and they just need to get the court order, you know, go through the front door, get the court order, get the approval, go to the businesses and say, we need all this information. And if you don't get this information, you can't do business in America. 
Um, there's, you know, there's some theory about extrajudicial. You don't have to do business in America for them to do that, which I don't exactly agree with. But, you know, they're still subject if, if they wanted to play by the rules that are established for these three-letter agencies to get that information. But that gets on to another level, which is that, unfortunately, many of these three-letter um, agencies aren't really playing by the rules we expect that they're playing with. You know, they may technically be legal. They may technically follow some standard of law. You know, but when it involves fooling the FISA judges and, and playing fast and loose with the interpretation of the rules, it really just leaves a sour taste in your mouth of some of those things. So, you know, Peter Todd, he's, you know, theorizing that it's these AWS servers that somehow the uh, NSA has a direct pipe into it. It doesn't create anything new. If they really needed and wanted the information, they could get it through normal legal channels. But, you know, there is enough evidence out there that that's not generally how they operate. There's this horrible thing going on of parallel construction um, where they basically go on the back end and do things which are objectively and technically illegal, get the information they need, and then they'll just give anonymous tips in to the other side of the Chinese firewall that says, hey, you should serve a search warrant at this time at this address and ask for this information. When they get that information from an anonymous tip, um, they get the information they need in the clean and in the clear to present stuff that's available in court. When the reality is they got that information through highly illegal means. I'm not even aware of that practice that, but the idea of an anonymous tipping system being used that way is pretty scary. Why do you think they made it? Have you ever tried tracking, say, some of the U.S. government auctions of the large amount of Bitcoins and seeing if you can see coins move? Um, I have done that. I actually did that in December. The first auction that they did was, it so far is very boring. Um, it went into a, a wallet controlled by Tim Draper, and I think it's moved once and they peeled off a little bit of it. Um, I should probably go back and look at it. But the more interesting one was the uh, second auction. I didn't look at analysis on this until the winners had announced themselves. But, you know, someone had identified some of the wallets. And they were getting at some hypotheses. But it showed some really interesting things with what they did the day of the transaction, if you look at the dates and some of the things they did. Um, you can, you know, the, the addresses are pretty well confirmed what the, the Dread Pirate Robert C's coins are. So I looked at one of these addresses and they peeled off, you know, the 50,000 Bitcoins they were selling. And, you know, it told an interesting story. When I was following the first time, uh, the, you know, Tim Draper was, was pretty nervous um, that they, you know, only would not do a test transaction of any of the Bitcoins to the address that they read. So, you know, in the interview that I read, you know, it's like, you know, we sent them the address, had them read it back three times. We're seeing they're all nervous until we get a confirmation on the blockchain and see if we can access the money. And there was a big old sigh of relief. But the Bitcoin Investment Trust, they actually had a series of 50 millibit transactions that went through prior to the large movement of the coin. So I wonder if in their bid, they required that as a condition of accepting it. And you could, you know, look through the blockchain, you could see the process of the first thing they did was they peeled off, you know, a nice 50,000 uh, 50, Bitcoin segment. And then they sent these nickel, um, these these bit nickel transactions to the to the ultimate destination addresses of the Bitcoin Investment Trust. So one of the things you might think is if they've just peeled off a nice you know hundred thousand Bitcoin or fifty thousand Bitcoin um, transaction to to hold and spend off of this that all the transactions might come from that. But the wallet that they were using had a different idea. They just saw that oh this is you know this is an address that's in our wallet and you're asking for a nickel and it's not currently um, we're not waiting for confirmations on it, so we'll just spend it from here. So the first thing I noticed is these nickels came from basically random spots on the tree. So that was kind of interesting to watch. And then, you know, you go down to some of the transactions and then they start sending out, um, you know, peeling off these nice large cold storage amounts going to the Bitcoin Investment Trust. And then after all the Bitcoin Investment Trusts were paid out, there was like an hour break, and then you started seeing some money to, to the Tim Draper of the 2,000 Bitcoins that he he received, and they sent him a nice 2,000 Bitcoin transaction, and Tim Draper immediately um, split it up into 500 Bitcoin stashes to make sure you know that they had it you know where they wanted to put it in. But no one, as far as I could tell, put it right into a, a multi-signature wallet. That was one of the things I thought was interesting. Hmm. Bitcoin Investment Trust, later on in some of their chains, they started showing up in multi-sig. Some of them didn't. So that was one of the interesting things from the Bitcoin Investment Trust. Now, you're using some kind of a version of a software that's not quite functioning right now? Yeah, um, I'm calling it Numisite. I'm getting ready, probably in March, I'm going to release a, uh, a freeware version of this that just has the, the transaction uh, viewer capability of it. Back in the summer when I was you know, more serious about making a separate company out of this, um, kind of cooled down on that. 
but I was I was putting in functionality for reporting. I was putting functionality to view the data, to create profiles, to identify these. Back when I thought it was going to be a high-end analyst tool, before I came to the conclusion that the market just isn't there yet, and you know it's it's a little too early to start a company for this. So what I'm planning on doing in March is actually relates to my day job. We're having a new release of Java, Java um, 8 Update 40, and it's got some new features in the uh, Packager, which is the, the part of Java that I work on, that allows you to set up things like file associations with, with the stuff that you package and, and put on the Mac App Store. So once that comes out, I'll be able to package up um, this this Numa site tool, just, just the transaction viewer part of it, just something that's a bit more consumable. Um, it was on the Mac App Store for a while under a name Follow the Bitcoin. That was pretty much the direct result of what I did for my hackathon entry that I did for the Coinbase hackathon. But the problem, you know, in between now and then, um, I was using the Bitcore. Um, there was an endpoint that BitPay was running, they called Inside, that was showing off their Bitcore API. But they changed the domain names on it. And, you know, they were, they were good citizens. They put a redirect notice on there to redirect you to the proper endpoint. But the software I was using on the inside of my software couldn't handle the redirects and just curled up and died. So right now, the follow the Bitcoin software doesn't work right now. But in March, um, you know, probably a year after I released the last one, I'll be able to get you know version of Numaside. I'm probably going to call it Numaside Explorer. You can just explore the transaction on the blockchain and get it and export pictures if you want to. It won't have any of the the reporting features I was building into it. But it's really eye opening to look at these transactions, you know, in in a, in a in a forest like setting rather than just looking at them as onesie twosie transactions that you get in the text based block explorers. I mean, you get a whole lot more um, fine grain information about each transaction, but it's, it's hard to see the relationships between multiple transactions when you're looking only at one at a time. So in the meantime, before you release, you basically have exclusive usage of this software you've created. And I guess if you wanted to do something else, you can just fine tune it any way you want. I do that all the time. Sounds exciting. <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh man, I really wish I had this feature so I could just go in and edit it and put it in. Today's magic word is output. O-U-T-P-U-T. Use the magic word to claim your share of this week's LTB coin distribution on letstalkbitcoin.com. Another big thing, I guess, that's kind of uh, right now is, is the price of Bitcoin. I'm gonna, I don't know if you have a, anything open to look at it, just so we can say what it is right now. I got 182.9. Oh, it's gone up. Yeah. <laughs> One of the things I hear argued a lot is just um, this is just going to force a reduction in mining just because it's not profitable to mine right now. And it makes sense. I don't know if you have any any thoughts on that. We've overshot um, this, the level of security that it, it is worth going on the, the blockchain to protect it because you only get 25 bitcoins per transaction. And let's see, 25 times 182. So you only get four thousand five hundred fifty dollars every time you mine a block, um, and you know if, if it costs you ten thousand dollars in electricity, you're going to shut it down. I mean, I think just just yesterday, CEX.io is shut down, has put a pause on their cloud mining. Um, they're they're not doing it until the price comes back up because, simply stated, they're losing money. Satoshi in his white paper talked a lot about the incentives of how mining would become commoditizing, and I think this is, you know, the overcorrection that we're seeing towards commoditizing. You know, mining is really only going to be done by these, you know, it's it's decentralized. It's not distributed. It's that there's going to be these larger centers. There's not a center. There's multiple centers that are going to be doing this large mining. And as long as, you know, no single mining block controls more than a third of the mining power, supposedly the uh, the Byzantine generals um, process that goes on with, with, with the mining and the longest block and the proof of work is supposed to stay up as long as no more than a third of it is compromised. You know, never mind 51% attack. The number I've heard is you need 66%. So I think what we're seeing is we're seeing some overcorrection on this, and it's going to go towards some of the uh, the centralized miners, um, you know, the hobbyists. I've never seriously mined any cryptocurrency because, you know, the economics to get a good return on it just gets crazy, and it's just getting crazier and crazier. It's mining bitcoins is, is an industrial service. It's not something that an early adopter would do anymore. People see the money and the value in it. You don't have to sell some Bitcoin miners that, you know, mining is, is it can be profitable and useful now that we've got, you know, working functional exchanges that you can get your money out of. The um, difficulty adjustment, I know it tries to adjust to 10 minutes. 
I always think of it as only adjusting up, but I don't know. Is it hard coded to only adjust up? No, it'll adjust down. And that's part of the problem that we're, I think we might see in this particular adjustment is that there's, it looks like there's a lot of hashing power that's come off. So the way that it does its, its difficulty adjustment is every certain number of blocks, not a certain amount of time, but every certain number of blocks, it looks back and it does a calculation. It's like, how much time did that take me to, to mine? And then it does some quick math. Well, then I should have the difficulty at this level to make sure that if, if that state was constant going forward, that would take me about 10 minutes to mine. So when the, when the hashing power is increasing on the network, you know, what should take two weeks, you know, 14 days will take 13 days or 12 days. You know, if the price keeps going down and more and more hashers um, keep shutting off their power, you know, we might see a few of these block adjustments. Instead of calculating every two weeks, you might calculate, you know, every three weeks or every four weeks. And it's, you know, going to cause some heartburn with people that's going to take 20 minutes per block until, you know, the, uh, the price and the number of people willing to do hashing comes back into alignment. You know, this is just the market forces in action. This is the invisible hand putting blood on the street. It's, it's, it's not pretty to watch, but it's, it's how the laws of nature work. As you're kind of explaining that, I mean, I can't help but think if you are running a big mining operation or a pool or something, I mean, it sounds like you could almost strategize on what you wanted to get out and when to get back in. There's, there's people that have been doing this. When, when uh, people are going to bring a large amount of hash power online, they will wait until the block of the adjustment before they start hashing. Um, they don't want to bring it on too early and bring up the difficulty too high. You know, if they're going to add several giga hash or even a tera hash onto the network. They want to make sure that, you know, they get the maximum value out of that for at least the two-week adjustment window, which is, you know, if they put in too much, it's going to be, you know, a seven-day adjustment window. I don't think we've seen any of that low. They absolutely do strategize to try and maximize the return on their investment. Uh, makes sense. What websites or uh, social media identities do you want to plug on this podcast? So I've got a couple that I do on Twitter. My personal one has been at Shemnon, S-H-E-M-N-O-N. And, you know, I'm a longtime groovy person. Um, Groovy is a programming language on the JVM. I do a lot of Java desktop stuff on there. So that's, you know, I've, I've, I'm kind of keeping my interest separate on that. Um, the one that I've been tweeting on most of my Bitcoin stuff is Numisite, N-U-M-I-S-I-G-H-T. Um, I used to have the Crypto Crumb, but I've, I've moved away from that. I'm using the, just the Numisite um, Twitter handle. Um, the blog that I have is blog.cryptocrumb.com. And I'm probably going to keep that going forward just, you know, as, as kind of the identity of, um, you know, just... You know, here's some interesting things that I found. Here's some educational things. Um, so like I mentioned, I'm, I'm working on writing a paper for an upcoming conference. And one of the things I might start doing after I, I present that paper is I might, you know, create some articles describing some of these transaction patterns and trying to keep a living dictionary of what some of these transaction patterns are and what some of them might be explained. But, you know, again, the problem with these is any of these patterns can be faked. Just because you see them doesn't mean that that's truly what's going on. So, you know, we could add a knowledge base to that to say, you know, this is... This looks like a normal spin and change, but it could actually be a coin join. You know, this looks like a uh, a mining payout, but maybe someone's just spreading it out to make it look like they're paying the miners when they're actually, you know, laundering money with it. You know, there's there's things that could go on like that. So that's you know something that I might be going forward on with with the blog going forward is is kind of a side hobby. In all seriousness, if people want to you know call me up and um, you know pay me to do some investigative consulting, I'm open to that. You know, I can be as public or as private as you want to be. That sounds great. Well, Dano, thanks so much for being on the Bitcoin game. It's great to be on the podcast. Bitcoin. Thanks for listening to the Bitcoin game. You'll make my day if you follow or tweet me at the BTC game on Twitter, or if you comment on this episode's page on letstalkbitcoin.com. You can find all the Bitcoin game episodes at thebitcoingame.com. See you next time.